Hello, and welcome to another webinar for the Aortic Dissection Awareness Week hosted by the John Ritter um, Foundation for Aortic Health. Wow, I've done quite a few of these this week. Um, today, I'm very excited about the subject that we're going to be talking about. Together, we are stronger, critical partnerships and projects in the medical community. We all know that the cornerstone of what we do is research and science and that it takes many people to accomplish that. So we're really excited today to have some really wonderful guests. But in the meantime, I wanted to do some housekeeping. We do have one more webinar tomorrow with Dr. Siddharth Prakash talking about exercise um, when you're at risk and post-AD. And I think this is a very important topic that many of you ask about. Also, this week, we're going to be kicking off an online auction. So be looking for emails about how to sign up so that you can join. It's going to be open for an entire week, and it's going to have some really, really neat items. And then finally, on our social media channels, you've probably seen hashtag pur purple pinky promise. We're asking people to paint their pinky nails and make a promise that they will talk to their doctor about their aortic health. So paint that pinky purple or just show us your pinky and challenge three friends to take the purple pinky promise. I hope to see all of your posts up there. So without further ado, I'd like to bring up our guests for today. I'm going to introduce them and then they're going to um, tell us a little bit about what they're doing in the medical field. So I'm just going to kind of go around the circle. We have Dr. Colin Bicknell, a clinical senior lecturer and consultant vascular surgeon at Imperial College Biomedical Research Center, London. Um, he is uh, representing the Aortic Dissection Charitable Trust out of UK. Um, he'll be joined by Dr. Graham Cooper later. Dr. Graham Cooper is the National Clinical Advisor for Acute Aortic Dissection to the NHS and also a trustee for the ABCT. We also have Jenny Lee, who's the research lead for the Aortic Dissection Collaborative and also a research scientist for the University of Washington. Hello, Jenny. And Bridget Porter, a dear friend of mine, but also a board member for the John Ritter Foundation. She's heavily involved with John Ritter Foundation as well as Marfan Foundation. And she has an incredible story um, that, of her being able to take loss into action and her passion is palpable. I can't wait for you to hear from her. And then finally, our very own Dr. Diana Milowitz, the president, a George H.W. Bush, Chair of Cardiovascular Medicine at UT Health, Director of the John Ritter Research Program. There's Graham. He just popped up in the corner. Hi, Graham. Good to see you. So that being said, we're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, you're going to hear from each one of these people about what they're doing. And then at the end, we're going to be doing a question and answer. So make sure you're putting your questions in the question and answer box. Um, and we will ask those questions at the end. So without further ado, I would like to pass it over to Jenny Lee from the Aortic Dissection Collaborative. Jenny. Thanks so much, Meredith. I'm really happy to be here with you all today. Um, so as Meredith said, I'm the research lead for the Aortic Dissection Collaborative, which is housed at the University of Washington. Um, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of what the collaborative is all about, uh, the work that we're doing, and specifically our work around um, patient-centered outcomes and patient-centered research in the research space around aortic dissection. So our project, uh, our collaborative has been funded by the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and their work is really housed around um, research that promotes the patient agenda in research. So identifying what's most important to patients and then moving that into research. And so that's the work that we're aligned with um, through our funding through PCORI, the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Um, and uh, really recognizing that patients who, people who have had aortic dissections have very different options for care. And that, and that oftentimes that's not based on strong evidence around um, long-term um, consequences or the options of, for care for each individual's context. So that's what we were interested in exploring from the lens of what really matters to the people who are in the community. Um, our objective is to create and sustain a network for our collaborative 
that includes a diverse group of stakeholders and individuals and organizations. And in a moment, I'll tell you about those individuals and stakeholders and organizations. Um, and really to deeply understand the patient's community, the patient community's research needs, what gaps there are, what's missing from the patient's perspective and the family member perspective and move that into the re research setting. And then also to think about what research methods are best suited to answer the questions that come out of that. So that's the work that we've um, been doing since August of 2019. Um, we're about two years into this collaborative, this project. So our collaborative is composed of a core advisory group who is um, really deeply involved in all of the inner workings of the collaborative. They're really helping to set the agenda. They're moving it forward. And those are uh, patients and family members. And we also have a larger stakeholder group. We're up to about 95 stakeholders in our stakeholder group that encompasses a lot more folks in this community. So that's patients, it's family members, it's also people who are doing research in this area, the patient advocacy community, um, clinicians, uh, industry representatives, with the idea that we're bringing people out of their individual organizations and into one big space together where we can work collaboratively as one. And that includes folks like the John Ritter Foundation and the Marfan Foundation and many, many others. Um, and what we have been up to over the last two years is to establish this collaborative, build the framework for it, build the network for it, um, engage all those people that I just talked about, and then do some work around identifying what the community's needs are, uh, making topics that we can identify through the, that work, and then moving into some research prioritization within the community. And so what that looked like is that we have done um, a couple of things. First, we did a community survey that really just was like a baseline of what is the experience of people who are living with aortic dissection? What has been their experience around getting care, healthcare? What is their experience around diagnosis? What is their experience around um, maintaining health and, and living their life with aortic dissection, post-dissection. Um, we then did a second survey uh, about eight months later where we took some of the learnings from that. We did an additional survey and then we also did a round of interviews, in-depth interviews. And at this point, we expanded that to include not just people who've had dissection, but also people who are at risk for dissection and their family members and care partners. So we did a really holistic look at... Um, at what the community's experiences have been and what their needs are. We then were able to identify some topics out of that um, and move those topics into uh, some focused work that we've been doing. So the, the topics that we found that were really important from the community's own perspective, where there were gaps existing for people in terms of their own knowledge and, and, whether, and also gaps in terms of what the evidence base is to support that area. And so six key topics really came out of that work. And, and those are, Topics around surgery, that includes timing of surgery, type of surgery, and, and other things like that. Um, also education, patient education, but also physician education, clinician education around aortic dissection. The mental health needs that are really can be very complex around living with or at risk for aortic dissection. Um, genetics is another topic. Medications for treating and preventing dissection. And then also a sixth topic, which is pregnancy. Um, aortic dissection related to the time during pregnancy and delivery in the postpartum. And so what we've been working on over the last six months really intensively, and, and several of the folks on this webinar today have been uh, involved in, um, is to take each of those six topics, and we've built out a working group within the collaborative around each one of those. And we have um, between 10 and 20 people at working really hard on each one of these topics to uh, look really broadly across the landscape of research and see what's already been done, where the evidence gaps are, and then make recommendations back to us, back to the collaborative, about what the research questions that remain unanswered in that topic area are. And then our next phase is to do two things. We're asking each group will be producing an academic journal art article that'll be published all together as a special issue of the journal um, Seminars in Vascular Surgery, and that'll be upcoming next spring. So that'll include all six topic groups will produce a, an article on their topic that explains the importance of that topic to the community, the research topics that they've identified within that overall topic and their recommendations for research moving forward. And then the second piece, which is really critical, 
is that we're going to take each of those research questions identified by each of those groups, and we're going to do another survey out to the broad community um, where anyone can participate, anyone who is affected by aortic dissection, that's patients and family members, it's clinicians, researchers, advocacy folks, everyone, to take our survey and tell us what they think out of the research questions we've identified, what should be the priorities for research moving forward. So that research prioritization, our hope is then we can share these findings of the work of the collaborative over the last two years and over the next several months until we wrap up this phase of our work, um, share it out to the broad community so that people can then, researchers and clinicians can take these things and they can turn them into research proposals that can then get funded and then really advance research in the areas that matter most to patients and their families um, and to do more amazing work in this area. So that's what we've been up to, and I'm very happy to share this update and happy to answer any questions at the end. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jenny. I appreciate it. And I've been so honored to be a part of this. And actually, I'm, I've am i been on the education committee, so it's been fascinating and really wonderful to have so many stakeholders that are so passionate about what's important. And honestly, just sitting there and having those conversations has been eye-opening to me as well. And I know it's just going to help with a roadmap for us going forward. So thank you again. Um, next, I'm going to be bringing up our friends from the Aortic Dissection Charitable Trust in the UK, um, Dr. Graham Cooper and Dr. Colin Bicknell. Meredith, thanks so much, and it's a great, great pleasure to be here this evening. I'm going to just share my screen to show some slides, if that's okay. Is that showing okay? It is. It is fantastic. Well, thanks, and good evening, everyone. It's, as I say, it's great very proud and great pleasure to be here working with the John Ritter Foundation this week. We were just going to spend a few minutes uh, talking about our charity here in the UK, a little bit about of a field guide for primary care that we've prepared, and then Colin's going to talk a little bit about our research, uh, our research work. So I can't advance my slide. There we go. So um, we launched our charity six months ago. It has three trustees, myself, Catherine Fowler, who um, is um, interested because she lost her father to an early dissection, and Pauline Latham, who's a member of parliament here in the UK and lost her son to a misdiagnosed aortic dissection two years ago. And you may not be so aware in the States of Bob Harris, Whispering Bob, who, but in the UK here is a broadcasting legend. Um, it's on national radio frequently, and he's suffered an aortic resection, and he is our ambassador. We um, have three strands of work for, for in the in the charity that, and these are the, those pillars are education for medical professionals and patients and we work to change policy to bring consistency ac across the whole patient, patient pathway um, from diagnosis through to follow-up and as Colin will talk a little bit about we've got a, a research arm as well and in the field of education, since the six months that we've launched, we've um, provided medical edu edu education to about 1,200 medical professionals. These are some of the groups we've been working with to do that. And um, Jenny mentioned uh, obstetrics and uh, um, aortic dissection in pregnancy, and that's an important issue over here as well. And we're working with the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecology to try and improve the pathway for patient pregnant women with dissection over here as well. Our field guide for primary care we released on the 19th of December, uh, September, just two days ago. The um, Primary care over here in the UK is pretty well organised. 
and but a speaking to primary care it's clear that there's a big knowledge gap around aortic dissection and uh, we put together the field guide to um, try and address that and it covers the areas that you would expect it to cover pathophysi pathophysiology the classification of aortic dissection epidemiology but um, it has a major focus on follow-up and screening, genetic testing, and lifestyle advice for patients. And what was particularly interesting when we put this together was that, uh, as I'm sure we're all aware, there are a lot of studies in the literature that estimate um, the incidence of aortic dissection, that is the number of new cases per year per head of population. But there is very little in the uh, literature on prevalence of uh, aortic dissection. That is the number of patients per head of population who actually are living with an aortic dissection. And of course, that's what general practitioners, at least in the UK, are interested in because a typical um, GP practice will have maybe 10,000 patients within it. And the general practitioners are interested in knowing how many uh, of the, those patients will have an aortic dissection. And it's quite difficult to answer that question. There is, in fact, only one reasonable study on the uh, prevalence of aortic dissection, and that is from South Korea. And it estimates that the prevalence is about 20 to 30 per 100,000 population. So the average GP practice in the UK will only have two to three patients with aortic, living with aortic dissection within it which is, um, I suppose, just highlights why we need to be able to provide this this um, this advice for general practitioners, because it's not a condition that they will be, or, um, they will see very frequently. And that's, so that's our, that's our field guide. It's available on our website, um, www.tadct.org. And uh, please feel free to have a read and use it as, as, as it may help you. And I'm just going to hand over now to Colin, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, the, our research activities. Colin. Thanks very much. And, and thanks ever so much for inviting me to, to, to talk this evening. It's, it's uh, a great honour. So uh, my name is Colin Bicknell. I'm a vascular surgeon by day. My day job is treating patients with aorta, aortic disease mainly, but I also do the rest of the vascular tree. Um, I do as much as I can to, to work with um, patients and, uh, and research in the, uh, in the aortic field. I'm the uh, uh, co-chair for the special interest group for the Vascular Society, and we've been working with the James Lind Alliance and patients to, to look at research priorities for aortic topics. And I'm the president of the British Society of Endovascular Therapy, which is a, a, a society that really looks at bringing the best endovascular technologies to patients and working with um, trainees to get the best training in, in the new techniques. But my newest role and uh, one of my proudest is to be the chair of the research group, the third arm of the charity, if you like. Uh, the research advisory group has been newly set up and we are launching the, the, the advisory group here and um, in seminars in the UK this week and last. Uh, it's made up so far of Professor Ang Wu, who is a uh, um, professor of cardiovascular surgery and, and a superstar of aortovascular surgery at BART. Uh, Professor Mark Field is a very well-known aortic and cardiac surgeon at Liverpool and lends his expertise. Uh, Professor Julie Saunders is a unique uh, individual. She is Director of Clinical Research at, at BARTS and runs the most fantastic patient engagement and uh, qualitative research studies. And is, we're very lucky to have her. And together with um, uh, our patients, we hope to make up a core advisory group with a wider field of, of, of patients advising us. So the, uh, the mission statement, if you like, or the aims, uh, overall aims of the research advisory group 
uh, is to support multidisciplinary research groups in the design, delivery and dissemination of patient relevant research in the field of aortic dissection. We aim to formulate a research network, including all the relevant st stakeholders with a real focus on patients who have, have lived with or are, are, are associated with patients with aortic dissection. We hope that we can develop a, a research strategy for aortic dissection to highlight the primary areas needed in research in, I guess, screening, prevention, treatment, and long-term survival of patients with dissection. And I hope that we can make that as patient-focused as possible. Mm. Uh, and we all know the, the, the impact of uh, patient-led uh, multidisciplinary groups to we need to influence the national agenda to support research in aortic dissection um, our aim is to uh, have a large group of uh, charity volunteers and of patients aligned with our research advisory group to provide input into the development of research projects and for surveys that come through the research board and where there is expertise, provide peer review advice and support for researchers and research teams in the planning and execution of some really important studies in aortic dissection. Uh, and importantly, something that's all often forget, forgot, it to ensure the appropriate and wide dissemination of research to patients and public. Uh, and that's really where we are. We're at the start of a journey and we hope to develop many worthwhile, long-lasting and excellent collaborations, both in the UK and across the pond. Thank you very much for listening to me. Wow, thank you guys so much. And um, I'm just so excited that the world is so small now with Zoom and these webinars. You know, COVID did have a silver lining that we're able to chat with our friends over in England and hear what they're doing. And together our megaphone is stronger. And I hear so many um, similarities of what you're doing, Colin, and what you're doing, Jenny, that I hope maybe you can share some of the information so that you're not having to repeat the same, the same research, um, especially with the patient voice led research. So I'm hoping that maybe after today, if you haven't connected already, uh, you guys can connect on some of your findings. Um, well, that was really exciting and I appreciate that. And next is a very dear friend of mine and John Ritter Foundation board member, Bridget Porter. Bridget. Hi, everybody. Um, I was thrust into this uh, in December of 2020 in probably the least desirable way and that my 13-year-old son um, complained of a backache. And in terms of the education you're doing with parents and physicians, unfortunately, we didn't have um, Louise Dietz on our radar until two months after Connor died when we got his tissue test back. So, but Connor was no stranger to genetics when he was younger. Um, as you know, many of these syndromes emerge over time and they can be confused with other things. So when he was younger, he was born, um, had a little bit of a difficult birth. They confused it with cerebral palsy because he had macrocephaly. Um, he had extra axial fluids of infancy. He didn't hit milestones. Uh, he was really floppy. So the doctors were speculating um, cerebral palsy, but he had double eye surgery, double strabismus eye surgery. And then he taught himself to read. He was brilliant. He was in the top 2% of the nation. Um, that eye surgery seemed to open up a whole new world to him. He was falling less. Um, and then, oh, you know, doctors scratched their heads and thought, we don't know what's going on. And then in 2016, my husband took him to the pediatrician and she noticed that there was a collection of different things and she thought a pattern and thought we should get him into genetics. So he was seen by genetics reviewed shortly after birth and then again in 2016 when he was nine. And so some of the things that she saw um, 
where he had, in addition to the things I already described, he had hypertelorism where his eyes were wide set. That wasn't necessarily documented, but post-death it was. Um, he um, had the larger head. He was very floppy. He had extreme hypermobilism. And then he developed pectus carinatum. Um, and he thought that was great because he was a huge Harry Potter fan and it sounded like a Harry Potter spell. So he had this pectus carinatum. Um, and then he had extremely flat feet. Um, so the genetics looked at him and said, you know, this is better than what we thought in cerebral palsy. He never really had a diagnosis of any sort. Just be very careful with his joints. So we moved from a two-story house where we couldn't have a pool because of easements and joints to a one-story house to where we could have him swim every day where we could have a pool. So we tried to do everything we could to make his life the best it could be. Um, but Connor was one of those kids and there's a picture of him behind me. When you saw him, he didn't necessarily, didn't necessarily scream Louis Dietz or scream syndrome, but when you looked at him closely and, and pulled all those things together, then he started getting migraines in the seventh grade. Um, he'd, he'd had them, but in the seventh grade, they got progressively worse. So we had taken him in separately for after the 2016 visit. He got kicked back to pediatrics with a follow closely, but no diagnosis. It was in the notes. And so as a tiger mom, right, um, I spend a lot of time in Asia. So I adopt that term for myself is I, I went in and said, hey, this seems anticlimactic. Isn't there some sort of testing that can be done? I don't know that just saying, hey, he's flexible like his mom and he's got a big head like his dad really tells us much. Is there a test? So the geneticist wrote back and said, no, no test. So then I went to the pediatrician and said, hey, you said this might be genetic. Shouldn't there be a test? No test. Well, and, and, you know, and then the email came back of not wanting to label a child. So it seems in our, at least in the American healthcare system, we get hung up on not labeling a child, whatever that means. And unfortunately, not my child's now permanently labeled in granite. And that might sound harsh, um, but that's propelled me to really want to do more testing. Connor, if you look at some of the pictures of him and some of the folks on the Louis Dietz Foundation, he looks more like the kids with Louis Dietz than he does the rest of our family. He definitely had the syndrome look. He definitely checked almost every box of every feature that a child would have. So we're part of the Kaiser healthcare system. Kaiser's run off epic. Every commercial Kaiser does this talks about how linked they are, how everybody talks together. So I feel like the next level would be to, to do something with that data and more and more health systems are on Epic. So if protocols would be followed, it would be A, with the symptoms that he had an echocardiogram, right? But that wouldn't catch everybody, but coupled with genetic testing, which is now much more accessible and much more affordable, that combination could have saved his life. So I think in these sorts of situations for pediatrics and most of the presentations today, the one thing that I didn't see covered was pediatrics. And so I think folks assume Marfan's and there's a long time to catch this and this child's not gonna dissect. But in Louis Dietz and given the gene that Connor had, they dissect as young as nine and Connor was 13. So I really think having a more systemic approach getting into a large healthcare system like a Kaiser, looking at their database, mining it for that data, for those traits, even when there's not a diagnosis. When we called the help desk that morning and said the, it was 90% peak of COVID, December, there was 10% capacity. So here you have a child in the middle of the night, in the middle of COVID, worst case scenario, the help desk didn't see, there was no connective tissue disorder diagnosis in their chart. The only thing that was in there was floppiness or loose ligamented. Um, but over the course of time, we'd brought him in for every single one of those traits. So if Netflix can tell me what movie I want to watch tomorrow based on what I've done in the past, I think our healthcare system can do a better job of mining the data that most of them use called Epic to write some algorithms to predict and identify the children and adults that would be at risk of one of these syndromes and do a combination of testing. And so that's where, when this happened to me, 
Hopkins reached out. So the Louise Dietz Foundation found me first. They introduced me to the Marfan Foundation, who introduced me to the John Ritter Foundation. And so for me, it's working with all of these foundations to get all of the resources together to try to do something to identify, diagnose, and treat. Even if Connor hadn't died, his life could have made, been made significantly better, right, in terms of he didn't have a care team that he should have had because no one diagnosed him. So he wasn't getting PT, OT, all of those things that would have made his life better. And in addition, if he would have just been put on beta blockers or his aorta been monitored, right? If they'd have checked his aorta, he could have had preventative surgery and he would still be here today um, is my belief. And he was a young, wonderful young man. So this is him behind me. Thank you. Wow. It never gets easier to hear your story. And I think about Connor a lot. And the reason we ask you here today is that science doesn't just stop with the researchers. Science doesn't just stop with the medical community. It takes people like you to push change. And stories like Connor's and um, you taking tragedy and turning it into action. So thank you. Um, as someone whose child is now at risk, since I have a familial aortic aortopathy that hasn't been identified yet. So um, thank you again for sharing the story. I know every time you share it, it's like you're giving a little, a little piece of yourself. So thank you. Um, and our final presentation before the Q&A is our very own Dr. Diana Milowitz. She is the President George H.W. Bush Chair of Cardiovascular Medicine, but she's also my friend and the um, head of the John Ritter Research Program, but she also runs our professional advisory board. And I think what's really important about this is that the, the John Ritter Research Program isn't the only piece of research and education. And so she's going to let us know about some of the other partnerships that we didn't get to cover today thus far. Diana? Yeah. Thank you very much, Mira. Um, um, so I talked about what the John Ritter Research Program was focused on. I talked about that yesterday in one of these webinars. I just want to mention briefly that we really want to go after all the genetic and environmental triggers for dissection so that we can come up with a dissection risk score for the general population and be able to identify people at risk. So um, we need people to participate in that study, and, and I hope you will consider it when we put the call out to recruit more people that have survived dissections and get more detailed data in terms of what they were doing, what drugs they were on, what, um, and, and so on. Uh, the John Ritter Foundation has a number of initiatives that we're working on right now. One is working with Bridget about trying to get into the um, EPIC system to start using machine learning and artificial intelligence to pull out those factors that'll tell us who's at risk for a die, uh, who is that rare patient that has a genetic syndrome that puts them at increased risk for an aortic dissection. And Bridget, I've got some updates from you that I can talk to you tomorrow about. <laughs> Things move very fast, as, as you know, when the ball gets rolling. We're also working with the American College of Emergency Physicians. This is a major uh, physician organization for emergency room physicians. Um, they realize that one out of four dissections are missed in the ER, and that often leads to premature deaths because they are missed. And they want to partner with us to go through their WIT records and use those same machine learning, artificial intelligence to pull, to look and see if there's factors in the ER that they, they can put together as a dissection risk score, which they want to call the Ritter risk score, um, that could quickly pull out that one out of uh, 100 or 200 or 300 patients with chest pain, pull out that one patient that actually has a dissection. So yeah. they have clinical data on millions of people that have come into the emergency rooms across the country, and a large number of those in their database had dissections. 
And so we're hopeful that through looking back more carefully at the clinical data, we can actually come up with a better way to diagnose or more accurate way to diagnose dissections in the ER setting. And then the beautiful thing about working with the American College of Emergency Physicians is they also, as part of the proposal, already have plans on how to push out any Ritter dissection risk score into emergency rooms across the country. So there's two phases, one to really define what will will, uh, allow them to improve the, the diagnosis of aortic dissection. And then the second part of the proposal is pushing that out to all the ER physicians across the country. So these are the things we're working on in the next year or two, but there's certainly other directions that we want to go. We There's been a lot of work on mouse models of thoracic aortic disease, and there's been a whole series of drugs that have cured mice of aortic aneurysms and dissections, but it's been very slow to move those drugs into clinical trials. And some of the treatments are very simple, something as simple as increasing a mouse aerobic exercise slows the rate of growth of growth of an aortic aneurysm. So some of these things are not even necessarily drugs, but modifying people's lifestyle and activity levels may slow the growth of an aneurysm. And so there's a lot to be done on that front. I we, uh, I think Graham mentioned that they're partnering with the OB, the obstetrics and gynecology group in the UK. We need to do that in the US. We need to get them on board, not only to help us pick up women that are at risk for dissection during pregnancy, but also in terms of managing thoracic aortic disease during pregnancy. We see a lot of women that aren't provided the correct information when they tell their OB-GYN that they have a thoracic aortic aneurysm. And so we really, I see everybody nodding their head. We really need to reach out to them in a partnership to improve that. And I'm sure this is something that came up in your studies, Jenny, in terms of what patients really want to see. The, in, in terms of improved care of um, different act, uh, different aspects of their of, um, of their life and living with a thoracic aortic disease or risk for dissection. And the last thing I want to mention is that the original treatment guidelines that were um, sanctioned by almost every single medical professional organization in the U.S., were uh, written back in 2010, and we have come together again to update those guidelines, and they will be released in the spring. And so these are updated guidelines that provide a lot more information in terms of the genetic basis of the disease, which we really was in, we were just beginning to understand it back in 2010. And then a lot more information in terms of treatment with different graft stents and so on. That's another area um, that's really exploded in the last 10 years. So be looking for that in the spring, coming out and being published. And, and hopefully uh, the, we, the John Ritter Foundation can help that move into uh, improved clinical clinical care by actually getting physicians across the country to up to, to uptake those new and improved treatment guidelines. So um, that's it. That I went in terms of what I had to say. I think we're now going to open it for questioning, and I'll hand it back over to you, Meredith. Thank you. All right, so we're going to pull everyone up, um, and I am fielding the questions. I keep pointing over here. That's because my second screen is over here. Um, So I promise I'm not just checking emails. And um, we have this incredible brain trust here, right? And I think that the, Jenny, I want to start with you, actually. What has surprised me was the, in the past, there has been researchers that have really held on to what they found out and held on until they published and things like that. But I feel, especially in this community, that that 
is changing and people are collaborating and sharing more information. Can you kind of um, explain that and how that kind of led to the collaborative with the shareholders and taking that a step further? Yeah, that's a great question, Meredith. Um, So what the collaborative is really focused on doing is helping people come together to have those conversations, um, especially in terms of research and advocacy organizations coming out of their own organizations where they're talking to themselves so that we can all be talking to each other across all of these organizations that are doing all this wonderful work. But we can really, like you said earlier, you know, we amplify each other's work when we can work together. And sharing collaboratively benefits everybody. It moves it all forward in a more effective way. You know, we've been doing this work around research prioritization, identifying what patients and their family members say are important to them in research. And our hope is that we, as the collaborative, may move on to write some proposals that could eventually turn into research. But really bigger than that, our hope is that the community takes this information, takes all this work that we've done and with, you know, partnered really closely with patients and their families, and we'll use that then other clinicians, other researchers at, you know, organizations all over the globe, hopefully, take our work, take these findings and translate that into research and that that gets translated into care that improves the lives of patients and families. And uh, Jenny, if I, if I um, understand the whole PCORI funding that you had for this project, you can actually come back in with recommendations from the patients in terms of yeah. clinical trials that should be done and, and further studies and PCORI will fund that. Is that correct? Yeah. That's exactly right. In fact, that's that's really our hope. So all of these patient prioritized research questions will be given to PCORI at the end of this, um, in May, at the end of this funding period that we've had through PCORI. All of that information gets filtered back to them. And then the hope is that they turn those into research uh, priorities as well for their, for their funded research agenda, for their portfolio of research, and that they will fund projects in those areas. And, and what PCORI often does is they give these, they're called engagement awards, where it's really about convening people, bringing them together, developing patient-centered research topics and questions. And then they'll go on to fund big, you know, five-year trials, um, pragmatic trials on those topics. Um, and so that's kind of that pipeline of moving from a collaborative effort to a research effort that's sustained over a longer period of time. And that's the goal. It's great. Fantastic. It, it's fantastic work that uh, the um, that you're doing. The in the UK, I, I feel like it's turning a super tanker, trying to go from the researcher knows best to things that to researching things that matter to patients and also involving patients in the design and delivery of the research and the dissemination. Uh, And it's um, even when it was introduced into into the mandatory um, uh, generation of protocols for the trials, uh, people were still paying lip service to the patient and public engagement. And an awful lot of work has gone on by the National Institutes to try and get, uh, get it done more uh, effectively but I feel like hopefully we we are some way to getting there it looks like you've done some really great work in trying to break down some barriers there yeah the patient centered outcomes research institute in particular is really squarely focused on exactly that type of research not all funders in the U.S. are quite as squarely focused on that um but (coughs) But fortunately, we have Pecori, who's doing this really important um, trailblazing work in that area. Excellent. So that actually brings me to my next question. So we, we've we talked to the patients, and we kind of have a circle, right? Because we talk to the patients about what research they want done. We get the research done. We make sure that it's palatable and you know, taking science and making it easy to understand. And then there's this huge canyon back to point of care. So I love the primary care guidelines that you guys have done, but Graham, can you talk a little bit more with so many people from our community on here that may not be doctors? How are you engaging the community in the UK, the patient advocates, the family members in educating their doctors with the research that we are funding? 
Okay, thanks, Meredith. Well, you, it, it might surprise you to hear that despite the, um, the, the fantastic organisation the NHS is, talking to primary care in the UK is actually quite difficult. And um, so we've, we've developed our field guide with a, a group of, of general practitioners who are interested in cardiovascular disease called the Primary Care Cardiovascular Society. So we have it out there at the moment through and uh, disseminating it to uh, primary care through that route. We, we hope that with my NHS England connections, we are going to be able to get wider dissemination of that of that of that work but um there's certainly an appetite in primary care for it it is just a question of 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 um of citing most general practitioners that the that the, the, the resource is there and that's our next sort of big task with this we're we're, we're we're very conscious that just putting it on the website and talking to a bunch of people who are converted isn't enough and that we've got to work harder with that to uh to actually land it on the on the desk of the working uh the, of the working general practitioners absolutely you know we found the same issue um is we kind of need a two-prong approach we need to go from the top down with people like asap the bottom up. yeah and from the bottom up, so patients bringing this this uh, scientific research to their doctors and really educating them. And Diana, you sort of touched on that with the AHA guidelines that you're hoping that they will take those guidelines and educate their doctors as well. So I appreciate that. So um, I did have some questions from some people in the chat that I want to get to. Um, there was a question from Catherine. She wanted to know what you guys thought about um, educating people about the risk factors of other things that could happen caused by TAAD, familial diseases. So to give an example, they got their aneurysm um, repaired, but now they're concerned about strokes or something else that could happen because of this connective tissue disorder. Um, do you guys have any answers on that? Um, Diana, we'll start with you. Um, so I, I'm not sure exactly what she's referring to. She may be referring to the fact that some of the genes um, will cause intracranial aneurysms and thoracic aortic disease. And then there's still other genes that can cause thoracic aortic disease and a risk for ischemic strokes. And so we, um, in terms of the treatment guidelines, we were able to provide some of the details in terms of the downstream complications beyond the thoracic aorta. But the guidelines were, it's a big document. And so we didn't uh, we're not happy with the details that we were allowed to provide in there. So we're actually coming together this fall to write gene-specific guidelines for the care and management that have a lot more details in terms of uh, that exactly what that downstream risk is, when does it occur, how to, what's the most effective way to treat it or um, to image for it, and then um, so that we can prevent those other complications of the vascular system. Now, it's not all the genes that cause a risk for down, down uh, but strokes. And so I think people need to know that as much as they need to know which genes do cause a risk for strokes. So we, we really want all that granular data out there. But it's still a lot for an individual physician to sit down and read through all the details. So we want to even move it into an app where somebody could open up a website or the app on their iPhone, put in the gene and the actual variant, and it actually spits out everything. What do you have to image for? How often do you need to image? What drugs are, do we recommend? And um, et cetera. So that's the long-term goal. <laughs> and or, ironically, the NIH has already funded the app when we don't even have the treatment guidelines written yet. <laughs> Sometimes everything ends up being a little, like if you have something really innovative, they're excited about it. So the actual work of going through and, and working with a group of experts 
worldwide to make sure that the guidelines are written with the state of the art knowledge and the consensus of everybody involved in the care of these patients around the world. It actually takes time and effort to do that and a lot of donated time by these experts. So uh, give us a couple of years. We'll, we hope to get there. That's great. Um, so we have a question that I'm going to pose one way and um, to ask Bridget, and then I'd like the rest of you to answer with your programs or programs that you know of. So Bridget, once you found out the genetic marker for Connor and what your family was at risk for, how did you get involved to start moving the needle um, for action? And what groups did you start working with? Sure. So, uh, you know, so one of the things it's emotional to talk about. So one of the things I realized is after Connor died, even then um, the med medical facility didn't want to do any testing. So we had to push back. They'd released his body to, wanted to release his body to the funeral home. So the first thing we did was work with the funeral director to refuse to pick up the body until he was tested because we knew that there was a high likelihood this was genetic and we wanted that genetic testing. And so one thing that I think we need to advocate for is when a 13 year old dies from a dissection, there should be some research done even or an autopsy, something regardless if you're a research institution or not. So that was one. So by finding out and getting the gene and getting the tissue after six days of arm wrestling and getting that valuable information, we were able to then go get our entire family tested. And so that was a huge peace of mind because Connor does have an older brother. And so knowing what allowed me to get involved was knowing that the rest of my family was safe. So once we learned that, then I had connected with um, Louise. I posted my information. I went onto Facebook and found the Louise Dietz group. And then I went onto Facebook and found the aortic dissection group. And then Gretchen from the Louise Dietz Foundation said, hey, I want to know your story. By the way, I work with Dr. Dietz of Louise Dietz. He wants to know what happened. Then Gretchen told me about this thing called Ritter Rules. So I got online and typed in Ritter Rules. And then I got onto that website and Facebook. And then this lady named Meredith reached out to me and said, we want to know about your story. So it was really just grassroots social media using Facebook and telling Connor's story. And then having a few phone calls with different people. And then the Marfan Foundation had a walk. And I've never done a walk before. And I just said, I can do this. And I set my goal at $2,000. And we raised $25,000 um, and did a walk in honor of Connor. And so it just snowballed um, in terms of educating people and learning and learning that, um, you know, th the reason I chose John Ritter to be my primary is I think it's really important that we start with the aorta, that there's a lot of things that are fueling into causing dissections. And the thing that I heard most often that oh, I'll be appropriate since this is probably being recorded really upset me as a parent was, hey, it's rare. So he should have died. It wouldn't have been caught by anybody. It was unknown. It was new. So to put it in perspective for me, I work in the Silicon Valley high tech. Louise Dietz was identified in 2005. Connor was seen by genetics in 2016. Those guidelines were written in 2010. So the Netflix of the world, the apples of the world, they're on it. They, they have their algorithms. They have their outcomes. They know their, their customers really well. And in the medical industry, there's a gap, right? There's technology, there's data, and it's useless unless if we use it. So pulling and then the fact that I'm in the middle of the Silicon Valley and my healthcare providers next door neighbors with all of these tech giants, I just, it's common sense to me that we not just should do better, we need to do better and it shouldn't take so much time. So that's how it snowballed. So there's my, told you I am passionate. So. You're very <laughs> passionate. And it, again, that you need passionate people because you'll, you're going to be able to connect the dots. You've already started connecting the dots and, and figuring out who to talk to and things like that so that the researchers can do the research and we can help push it into action. So, and, and um, I work for a company that makes packaging, packaging for high tech devices. And so when Connor first died, I pulled his entire EMR, all 2000 pages or whatever. And then I went through it and summarized it in writing and then pulled in my packaging quality team, and they did a quality wishbone 
They did a root cause analysis. And so when I went into Kaiser and presented the quality wishbone, what should have happened? What are the corrective actions? What are the preventative actions? And treated it like it was a customer meeting just because I'm not a doctor. I, I sell packaging for a living. And some of this stuff was just a no brainer. It's we can do better. And it's, it's not that complicated. Right. Right. So, yeah. And, and so, and Bridget, oh, you, uh, you, you bring up a really important point and it's still um, a thing that I'm having difficulty address, addressing. We can get up to the patients that survive those sections. We, it's really difficult to capture the patients that don't survive the dissections and get those samples. So we're missing um, up to 50% of the people and that so have dissections rare. in our genetic studies. Yeah. And, the re- the re- and we've been working really hard to recruit um, cases from the medical examiner's offices in the morgues here in Texas. And it's just difficult to get the family's attention during that short time to say, you know, genetics is important in this disease and we really need to say something, some piece to that we can get DNA out of. And um, so I think that's something that we can work with Jenny or some other group or with the people involved in the JRF to try to come up with a way to better approach those families because you, you just, you know, when they're grieving, it's difficult to get that message across to them. Well, and that's something I'd be willing to help families. As somebody who's lost someone and who's traveled that road, there are clear benefits to me that now I have peace of mind that Connor died from an aortic dissection, but I know my other son won't. And then he got to resume his life. You know, the day we got it cleared, Stanford was also the Marfan Clinic at Stanford helped us tremendously. So Dr. Liang is who cleared my older son, and he was amazing. And so the same day we got his genetic test results back, and Dr. Liang looked at his echocardiogram and was our second opinion on everything. We had him back on the court same day, right? So his life was on. And so for a 16 year old boy, not being able to exercise during such a stressful time only compounded things. So it's made a world of difference to have him resume as much of normal life as possible. And Meredith, can I just jump in? Diana makes a fantastically important point there about the 50% of people who suffer an aortic dissection who don't reach hospital and, and how we reach them. In the UK, we have this, we don't have medical, we, we do have medical examiners, but they're not medical examiners as you have in the US. We, we have coroners who are lawyers essentially who will uh, investigate any unexpected death. And they consider aortic dissection to be a natural cause of death. So it generally doesn't lead to any further investigation. They issue a death certificate and say that they they died from a a natural cause. And one of the bits of work we're doing is with coroners to try and educate them that this is something that does need further attention than simply to 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 to, um, sign a death sign off a death certificate as a natural cause because they will do do that even if the patient was visited an ED twenty four hours before with chest pain, they'll still sign that off as a natural cause of death. So we're very engaged in trying to pull them on board to get them to um, to understand the importance of identifying the or the importance of the the the, 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 the can be attributed uh, is the, the importance that these deaths can have. Right. If we could just get them to put on the death certificate that the family, not the death certificate, but the report from the medical examiner that this is a this there's a significant genetic component and the family members need to be talk to their doctor about their risk for dissection. Yeah. Well I think we might even be able to go further because we have a thing called the Human Tissue Act in the UK which puts a lot of regulation around gathering um, tissue specimens from patients and that includes people who are dead but with the the family's consent, it would be possible to, to do a percutaneous biopsy of the spleen of these people to 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 get some genetic sampling. So that's another area we're we're, we're looking at. So that's where we landed with with my son is we took a portion of his thigh, right? And so they just did the tissue sample to make sure. 
So they agreed to do that to be able to clear the rest of the family. So rather than a full autopsy, we yeah. compromised on the tissue test. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that, that I think my, I'm not a, well, Diana's a much greater expert than me, but I'm not a great expert. But my understanding is that, yeah, a bit of tissue, a bit of spleen, I'm told. Is the first. Right. Well, I want to thank everyone for attending, for being here. Um, there might be somebody on this call who has a great idea of what to do around getting to the medical examiners. And and so if you do, email us at info at johnritterfoundation.org. I appreciate you all. This will, this has been recorded. It will be available on our website, johnritterfoundation.org. Um, again, thank you so much. Don't forget to paint your pinkies purple to Pinky Promise to talk <laughs> to your doctor about your aortic health. <laughs> and I appreciate you all so much. And um, it's just so nice to know we have such incredible people in our corner doing research. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.